Welcome back. In this video, we move to chapter 2 about the Han Banach theorems. So, there will be three sections in this course. Section 2.1 about the analytic form of the Han Banach theorem, and it deals with the extension of linear functionals. Second section is about two geometric forms of the Han Banach theorems. Uh, which deal with the separation of convex sets. And this section is, is about the bidual of a norm space and orthogonality relations. So in this video, we are, go are going to cover the first part of section 2.1. So, as we said, we want uh, the problem is to extend a linear function defined on a subspace of a vector space to the whole space. So we have two problems. Problem one, we have a vector space E and a subspace G of E and a linear functional from G to R. And we ask if we can extend G to a linear functional to the whole space. This problem is easily solved. It's enough to take an algebraic complement of G, not of E, of G. As we know from chapter zero, any subspace has an algebraic complement. So uh, any element of E can be split, can, is, can be written as the sum of two elements, one in F and one in G, <coughs> in a unique way. So we just set F of X. So if X is in E, we can write X equal X1 plus X2, where X1 is in G, X2 is in F. And we set f of x equal g of x1. Now, it's very easy to check that this f is linear. And, of course, it extends g, small g, because if x is in g, then x2 is 0. So, x equal x1. So, this is very easy. <clears throat> now, the second problem. Suppose that E is a norm space, and g is a subspace of E, and we have, again, a linear function, but which is, moreover, continuous. And the question is, can we extend small g to the whole space with preserving continuity? This problem is more difficult. So let us write the condition. What does it mean that small g is continuous? Uh, it means that there exists a constant c, such that g of x is less or equal than this constant times times the norm of x, or all x in capital G. Okay, now instead of working with a norm or a multiple of a norm, which is itself a norm, we can work with, we can tackle a more general problem. So we can work with what we call a subnorm or a Minkowski functional. Okay, so now we move to defining this uh, notion. And by doing so, we will be able actually to tackle another problem, which is of geometric nature. Okay, this is this will be the second form of the Han Banach theorem. Okay, so <clears throat> if we have a vector space E and a function P from E to R, not linear in general, we call we say that P is a subnorm or a Minkowski functional if it satisfies the two following properties. P of lambda x equal lambda P of x for every lambda positive and x in E. So this is what we call positive homogeneity. Okay. And second property is, you can call it the triangle inequality or sublinearity if you like. Okay. okay, so let us give examples as usual. So of course, a norm is a subnorm. So I have a lot of examples of norms. But let us, let us give something less trivial. Let us give an example of a subnorm which is not a norm. So if you take, consider E to be the space of continuous functions from 0, 1 to R. And for U in E, so for U, U here is a function. So P of U is the supremum or the maximum, of course, of U of T, not of the absolute value. Okay. Now, it's easy to check, to check that P satisfies the, the two properties of a subnorm. It's a, so it's a subnorm. So, okay. so P of lambda U equals lambda P U if lambda is positive, and you have the triangle inequality. 
So it's a it's a subnorm, but it's not a norm. Why it's not a norm? Because if p of u equals zero, then it doesn't mean that u is zero. It just means that u is negative or zero. Okay, because I'm not taking the absolute value. Okay, similar example. If we take the space of continuously differentiable functions on zero one, and you set p of u to be the supremum or the maximum of u prime, because u prime is continuous here. So once again, we get a subnorm. It's very easy to check. And this is not a norm because if p of u is zero, uh, we, so we just can conclude that u prime is less or equal than zero. So and even if u prime is zero, you cannot conclude that u is zero. So u could be a constant. Okay, and if, <clears throat> yeah, so, so this is another example of a subnorm which is not a norm, and also you may check that the sum of two subnorms is a subnorm. And a very important example, which is of geometric nature, uh, if you have a norm space uh, E and a convex subset of E which contains zero, for every x in E we set P of x to be the infimum of all the positive numbers alpha, such that one over alpha times x belongs to C, or if you like, x belongs to alpha C. Okay, then uh, we'll not prove that it's a subnorm. We'll prove it uh, in section 2.1 <clears throat> that this is really a subnorm, and we'll give a geometric interpretation. What does this mean, actually? Yeah. So this is, a, this is called the Minkowski functional of C, or the gauge of C. Okay, so we'll get back to this later. And we'll prove some kind of converse in the exercises. Any non-negative subnorm is of this form for some convex set C, containing the origin. Okay, Because by definition, such function is bigger or equal than zero because it's the infimum of alpha positive. However, the example, the examples above are do not possess a constant sign. So this p of u here in this example could be negative. Here again, okay. So this is why you have to assume that uh, it's not negative to be of this form. Okay. So we'll get back to this later. Okay. So. Now we are ready to state the general form, analytic form, of the Hahn-Banach theorem. So we have a vector space E and a subspace G of E. And we have a subnorm, P, and a linear functional G from the subspace, defined only on the subspace, capital G, which satisfies this inequality. So if P is a norm, then this inequality just means that G is continuous. Okay? And we'll apply this to the correlates. But P need not be a norm. Okay? It could be anything. Then, this is the answer to our question. Yes, there exists a linear functional F defined on the whole space that extends G and still satisfies the same inequality. Okay, okay now... I will prove this theorem in the next video. So, but now let me uh, derive some consequences, some corollaries of this very important theorem. First corollary. Now we have a normal space E and we have a subspace G, not necessarily closed. And we have a linear bounded or linear continuous map G, defined on capital G. Then we can extend G to a linear continuous map, F, defined on the whole space. And moreover, we can manage to conserve the norm. Okay? The norm of F in the dual, this is the operator norm, this is by definition the supremum of F of X, where X is in the unit ball, the closed unit ball of and the norm of G in G star is the same thing, but we restrict ourselves to the unit ball of G. Okay. 
So this is a direct consequence because if g is continuous, then we know that g of x is less or equal than the norm of g times the norm of x. And norm of g times norm of x is a norm, actually. Okay? So it's a multiple of a norm. So it's a subnorm. Okay? So if we apply the theorem 2.1, we get a, fun a linear function, uh, functional f defined on the whole space that satisfies norm of f, uh, f less or equal than norm of g times norm of x. And this implies, as you know, that norm of, so f is bound, uh, continuous, of course, and norm of f is less or equal than norm of g. But it's very easy to check that norm of g is less than the norm of f because in the norm of g, we take the supremum of the unit ball on g, which is contained in the closed un unit ball of E. Okay. So this is the first result. So we have a positive answer to our second problem now. Yes, we can extend a linear function to the whole space and conserve continuity. Okay, next corollary, we have a normal space. Then for every element x0 and e, we, we can find a bounded linear form or functional f sub 0 whose norm in the operator norm is the norm of x0. So this is the norm in E star, this is the norm in E. And the value of f of 0 at x0 is just the square of the norm of x0. This is just, once again, a useful notation for f of 0 of x0. Okay, why this is a corollary? So we just apply the previous corollary and we take capital G to be the one-dimensional space uh, generated by x0. Now, of course, if x0 is 0, uh, there's nothing this is trivial because just take f0 equals 0. Okay? So, but this, this is interesting when x0 is not 0. Okay? So in this case, G is one-dimensional. And we define small g on this one-dimensional space, which is just isometric to R. So any element in capital G can be written as a multiple at t times x0. So we define g at t x0 to be just t times the, norm, the square of the norm. And this is a constant. So it's easy to check that g is linear. And the norm of g in this one-dimensional space is just the norm of x0. Okay, so it can... Uh, Okay, so just have to write the details. So the norm of G is just the norm of X0. <clears throat> okay, so by the previous corollary, we can extend G to the whole space to a bounded linear map uh, that I call F0. And now the norm of F0 equal to the norm of G, which is norm of X0, so this is satisfied. And F0 of X0 since f extends f0 extends g, then f0 of x0 is equal to g of x0. But by definition, g of x0, just put t equal 1, is just the square of the norm of x0. So this. Okay, so this is the second uh, consequence of, and this is important. Less corollary, if you have a norm space, then the norm of x in E is equal to the supremum of f of x where f is in the unit ball of the dual. And this supremum is actually a maximum. Okay. So this is just the value. And actually, we can uh, drop the absolute value. Okay. Uh, exactly as we drop the absolute value in uh, the definition of the norm of f. Okay. Why this is true? Of course, if x is 0, then everything is zero, so zero equals zero, nothing to prove. So assume that x is different from zero. Since f is, okay, now take f uh, to be an element in the, uh, in the unit ball of the dual. Then f of x, if it's, uh, since it's continuous, f of x is less or equal than the norm, the operator norm of f times the norm of x. And since f, the norm of f is less or equal than one, then f of x is less than norm of x. But this is true for every f in B star, in the unit ball of E star. So the supremum over the unit ball of E star is less or equal than the norm of x. So here we are fixing x and we are letting f vary in the unit ball, the dual uh, ball. Okay, now we have to prove the reverse inequality. 
If we apply the previous corollary to x instead of x0, we find an element f0 in the dual whose norm is precisely x, is the norm of x, and its value at x is the norm of x squared. So if we set f1 to be 1 over norm of x times f0, then the norm of f1 will be just norm of f0 over norm of x, which is 1. So f1 is in the unit sphere, and therefore in the unit ball of the dual. And f1 of x just divide by norm of x is just the norm of x. So actually, this means that the supremum is a maximum. So, so this means that the norm of x is less or equal because this is just f1 of x. And f1 of x is less than the supremum. So we have the reverse inequality. And uh, the, 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 the idea that we found an element f1 in the unit board and the unit, the unit sphere, actually. So, so we can put here maximum on the unit sphere, if you like. So we, this proves that the, we have equality, actually, and the supremum is achieved. It's achieved at some point f1, and this f1 is given by the Hanbanach theorem. Okay? So we have equality. And... <clears throat> Last remark, uh, don't confuse this, the formula giving the operator norm of f as the supremum over fx, where x varies in the unit ball of e, which, which, was, which is just a definition, actually, with this theorem, which is, uh, which is a theorem, actually, not a definition. Okay? So we have to prove it. So it can be confusing why, because in the definition, we fix f, we let x vary in the unit ball of E. In this theorem, we fix x and we let f vary in the uh, closed unit ball of the dual. Okay, so here f and x do not play the same role. And we have also to note that in the definition of the operator norm, the supremum need not be achieved, need not be a maximum, as you know, from second year. And there is an exercise in chapter zero where I prove that this is the supremum will not be achieved. However, in this theorem, this corollary, nor the the supremum is always achieved. Okay, so these are two distinct uh, formulas, but they look alike because it's just the same form. But f and x do not play the same role. Okay, so this concludes the first part of um, <clears throat> section uh, 2.1. And in the next video, I'm going to give a proof of uh, the Hanbanach theorem. So, thank you for your attention.